the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. This is Dan Giffen. Uh, today I'm extra stoked for our guest, JJ Bread. Um, I probably just said your name wrong. I'm really sorry, JJ. I can't roll my R's, but JJ is a brilliant independent researcher, software developer. He's been doing a lot with machine learning with music, which we're going to talk about today and a lot of other cool stuff that he's doing with music technology and just building innovative tools. Uh, JJ released Factor Synth and Factoid, which are uh, machine learning plugins using Max for Live. We're going to talk about that. Uh, but before we dive into today's episode with JJ, uh, I just want to make you aware if you don't own Ableton Live 10 Suite or Standard, I would be glad to be your plug and hook you up. Uh, just go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton, liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton, and you can get a nice special discount and save your piggy bank, and I would be happy to hook you up. Also, if you want to go deeper in your Ableton Live skills or you just kind of feel like you hit a wall and you feel stuck with what you're learning and you've just spent endless hours searching, wandering on YouTube and you just don't feel like you're going anywhere, I would be happy to give you some direction and work with you month to month to learn in Ableton Live and help you work on your own projects to reach your musical goals. More about that on liveproducersonline.com. Check out the pro membership. Um, use the discount code SAVE15 for a limited time and you can save some money on the membership and make some music so and if you're an instagrammer you can hear the music that i'm creating under my artist name philia just go to at philia music p-h-i-l-i-a on the gram and i'd be happy to connect with you there too without further ado today's episode with jj i'm excited to have him on the podcast and thanks for tuning in guys you're a researcher and software developer, and you've been doing some really cool things with machine learning. Um, you just not too long ago released a Max for Live device called Factor Synth, and uh, I think Factoid is your newest one. Is that the newest device you released? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I was playing with that this morning. It's re that's some really cool stuff. Um, Thanks. Yeah, I'd like to talk about those and some of the other devices and the research and development you're doing. But before we dive into all that, I guess, leading up to it, how did you get started with music and how did that lead you up to the research and development you're doing today? Sure, right. So I I grew up in uh, Madrid, Spain, and, you know, so I, I started uh, with piano lessons and music, music lessons when I was pretty young, like around age uh, eight. And soon afterwards, uh, I think I was watching TV and I discovered this crazy uh, French guy called Jean-Michel Jarre, who was putting these incredible uh, light shows and these uh, concerts, you know, with lasers and, and skyscrapers. And I was and I was amazed with that. So as a, as a little kid around eight or 10 years old, I was really fascinated. I was obsessed with this guy for, for a while. My parents bought me this uh, first, it was a keyboard, like a digital synthesizer. It was an N-Sonic uh, S. Q2, I think. Talking about the, I'm talking about the early 90s, right? So a while ago. Yeah. And so I had these two passions, right? Uh, music and computers. I ended up studying um, electrical engineering uh, in Spain at university. And in Europe, we have this um, exchange program that is called Erasmus, you know, which uh, allows you to spend uh, one year of your studies abroad at a different mm -hmm. university in Berlin. So I spent the last year of my studies in Berlin, and that was around uh, 2001. Mm -hmm. And at that time, well, you know, Berlin was already a, a center, an important center of, of electronic music. Yeah. It was not only about the, the clubs and the, and the producers and, and the bands that are based there, but uh, it, is, it was already a city back then uh, where there was an important uh, culture of, of music technology. Um, at that time, there was a time where uh, companies were starting, like, you know, Ableton is in Berlin and uh, mm -hmm. Native Instruments and, and a bunch of other companies mm -hmm. doing great stuff with uh, music software. And also, uh, more important for my case is that um, in the academic world at universities, uh, there was also this, um, yeah, this, this, this culture of research in, in music technology. I discovered that there was this uh, hidden world of music technology research in the university uh, where there, is, uh, there was a huge uh, amount of people doing um, very cool stuff like uh, automatic classification of music, transcription, uh, recommendation, navigation discoveries. So 
these technologies were starting at the time and afterwards sometimes they have resulted in in cool apps or, or products like uh, you know shazam or mm. uh, the, the places recommendation in spotify these kind of things uh, at that time it was mostly in academia and i got into contact with that uh, finishing my studies there and it was really uh, the discovery of uh, of a new world in research and I decided to uh, stay a bit longer there uh, and it ended up six years in Berlin to do my PhD on uh, on music technology. Yeah. So that's how I started into this, into this world of music technology. I did research during my PhD on something called source separation, mm. uh, which is about unmixing instruments uh, from, from mixtures, like removing a voice, removing a dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, and after that, I ended up having a job in in Paris, also in music research, at a place called uh, IRCAM, which is um, a very exciting place to do uh, music technology. So it's, for example, where the Max language was invented. So Max, which is really the, okay. yeah, yeah, sure. Awesome. So it, back in the eighties, uh, it was invented there. Then it was developed by a company, and then it was, uh, so as you know, like now it. 74 right exactly did they pick up that technology from ircam then yes so okay. the guy the guy who started cycling 74 was collaborating collaborating uh, at ircam with really? the guy who invented uh, max oh cool uh, That's a good history it's... lesson i didn't know that yeah 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 nice. and so afterwards um after a couple of years there at ircam I decided to go independent uh, and uh, right now since uh, several years i'm and dedicated to helping uh, musicians and small companies, you know, discover the cool uh, possibilities that machine learning uh, offer to the music, uh, to music applications in general. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we are going to talk a lot about machine learning. I want to pick your brain more on that topic in a lot of different areas. But uh, for the listeners on this podcast who are like not really sure what that even means, like how would you define machine learning in music? So machine, yeah, machine learning in general is... Um, a set of methods that um, allow computers to extract patterns from data, right? So it doesn't sound very uh, science fiction like that, but it, it's really what it is, right? So it's it's a, a set of computer programs, if you want, or of algorithms. An algorithm is it's just a method or a program. It's nothing more like that. So it's a, it's a program that a set of programs that that reads a series of data stored in a in a computer and uh, derives or extracts patterns from that data. So, for example, in the music case, you will have a collection of songs stored in your in your hard disk, and uh, there is an algorithm that will load all of these songs and that will analyze the songs. Like it, it will uh, extract how fast is the song, or how um, the 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 overall frequency content, what kind of melody it contains, what kind of instruments. So, mm -hmm. uh, information that is a bit tricky to extract automatically. That's part of the challenge. But once the program has gone through the data, it starts comparing all the uh, information that uh, it has extracted from all the data. It uh, derives common things like, for example, okay, I see that in this database that you have, like half of the songs uh, have a very have a very harsh sound, and the other half has a more a soft sound. So maybe this is more like uh, you know rock, and this is more like classical music. So mm -hmm. this is a simple example, but this is just what it is. It's, it's um, an automatic extraction of patterns from data. And in the particular case of music, it's, uh, well, from sound and, and music data. Yeah. Yeah. And your factor synth, I feel like, is a, a good example of that. It's a Max for Live device you released not too long ago. And um, I, it could be a little overwhelming for anybody who opens it the first time. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot you can do inside of it. It's, it's kind of a beast of a, a device. But uh, it was really cool. I mean, I was playing with it. You can just drag and drop an audio clip straight into it. And it basically creates all these different randomized patterns that you can generate to play back that audio and chop it up. But also you can do some source separation uh, where you could basically mute the kick drum. Say if you dragged a master file into there of an entire song that's already compressed, it can kind of deconstruct the material and the different instruments already in that clip, which is interesting. 
it takes a little bit of use getting used to at first, but but it, it sure. is some cool technology going on in the back end. How did you get started in developing that? And maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit of what's under the hood and what it's doing. I had the idea of FactorSynth when I was working on, on source separation. And um, uh, well, as I told you, so the goal is it's a very challenging thing. So it's really from a mix, a stereo mix or even a, a mono mix, uh, you want to extract full instruments. Uh, for example, you have a song and you want to make a karaoke version of it. And so you want to get rid of the, of the voice. Or uh, you have a, a movie soundtrack uh, with a dialogue on it, and um, you want to remove the dialogue in order for, in order to create a version of the movie in a new language. You want to uh, dub the the a new dialogue over the original music. So these kind of things are are the applications that are uh, sought by um, by source separation. And it's a pretty tricky stuff. It's very challenging, and uh, very often you need uh, some manual correction. So it's not fully mm-hmm. automatic. That's very hard to do fully automatically. Yeah. Actually, in this in the last couple of years, three four last years, uh, there's been a, a new change uh, in quality and a, and a, and a big uh, leap in quality and in progress on that area, due to this business of uh, deep learning you know mm-hmm. this whole new bunch of methods that are based on neural networks well yeah. this is this is not what uh, what factors in uh, does but in terms of quality they have really make uh, lots of advancements in the in the last year mm-hmm. but besides uh, deep learning methods the other v- most popular method for source separation is called uh, matrix factorization. Matrix factorization is uh, what uh, factor synthesis is based on, right? And so right now you have these two kinds of methods. The one that are uh, based on deep uh, learning and the ones that are based on matrix factorization. Each one has its advantages and, it, and its problems. So uh, matrix factorization is maybe a bit worse in terms of quality. But what is very cool about it is that uh, it's very easy to, um, once you obtain the components, you can display them and you can manipulate them and you can uh, understand them. You can interpret them in more or less intuitive ways. It gives you more uh, control as a user, right? Exactly. Or exactly. Being able to manipulate the different pieces of audio it's pulling. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And the challenge of uh, for me of doing a factor synth was to take this method, this algorithm matrix factorization, uh, which is um, as a, it's usually available in very specialized like software frameworks uh, uh, aimed at research. So uh, most of the time you need to, to do some coding or uh, or use some very specialized libraries. So my idea was to start from this, let's say, academic or technical method and package in it in a way that could be uh, a bit more intuitive to use mm-hmm. uh, by people who are not necessarily uh, uh, coders, right, or developers. Right. And so I took this matrix factorization idea and uh, I thought it could be used uh, not only for source separation, but for more, you know, if you want, uh, if you will, a creative things like as you said randomizing extracting separate elements and uh, these kind of things and the first version that i released was really um it was a patch in in max not even ableton live at the time it was just a plain max and i put it online you know for for free to download uh, and at that time i think it was uh, around 2014 and 15 it was used by um, by uh, by several composers here in Paris who were doing um, to, you know experimental uh, electronic music. They were excited about that, uh, but uh, mostly talking with them and with other people, they started saying that uh, well, this is this is cool and this could maybe be useful also for other types of electronic musicians, for yeah. example, DJs that could maybe use it for. Uh, uh, live uh, remixing or uh, changing loops on the fly uh, yeah. and these kind of things. And I thought, well, uh, you know, there is my favorite sequencer, which is Ableton. On the other on the other hand, Ableton, as you know, contains Max for Life, which is uh, Max, 
Yes. Right. Yeah. So half of the job is already done. Yeah. And I Story can take. It, so it was really an easy decision to take. Which which format? Uh, in which format can I release it so that more people can use it? So. Yeah. It was really a, a, a no brainer. So it has to be a Max for Life device, mm-hmm. and of course I had to adapt the interface and I had to sure. make it uh, work uh, with better with Ableton Live. And that's uh, how uh, how I came up with. Uh, with the idea of releasing it as a Max for Life device. Yeah, I can see or imagine how much work was put into creating that just by hitting the edit window on the Max for Live device itself. There's a lot of, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of stuff in there, man. There's yes, yes. Stuff. Yeah, for it's sure. It's true. I, I get lost sometimes myself as, as well. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> I'm still fairly new in the world of Max, but it's a deep rabbit hole. You can go down for forever and get lost. But uh, in a lot of good ways, I mean, you can do so many different powerful things and it's a cool device that you created. Um, there's there's other machine uh, learning or audio separation tools, source separation tools out there. I know you did some research and development with Audionamics. Right, yeah. I know that they have a software called Extract Stems 2. Mm-hmm. I'm not super familiar with that. I wasn't sure if you did any work with that or if you've played with that and and your take on how well that actually extracts the stems from a stereo file for, say, remixing a song or something. Yeah, I think that's the last iteration of the tools that they released. And fortunately, I don't know it very well because I wasn't working uh, there anymore when when they released it. So I worked there until uh, five years ago. And at the time, they had something called Tracks or, uh, yeah, Tracks 2, Audionamics Tracks, Mm -hmm. which was actually also pretty cool and uh, it but it was dedicated mostly to um, vocal separation right okay. to the separation of vocals and then you had a representation where you can like correct if uh, the pitch has been well extracted and you can do uh, some manual corrections on it mm-hmm. and once a little bit of manual work is done you could really get very very nice results cool. uh, the last one stems i i really don't know it well i'm, I'm sorry but i think sure. uh, I, what i know for sure what i can tell you for sure is that audionamics and i don't tell this because i used to work there <laughs> i mean it's really uh, i would say the the leader in in music source separation right now so it's That's awesome. it's very yeah yeah seems like there's a high demand for that especially on the user end there's a lot of people who want to be able to take stereo files especially and be able to extract the audio out of them for remixing purposes or composition or scoring or whatever they want to do um it's a it's definitely a field that's continued to grow and and go deeper and more research and i think it's really cool what you're doing with these new max for live devices and it'll be interesting to see the technology only get better and better because i i still have yet to find a software for me personally that is 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 perfect in the sense of being able to extract the audio without any kind of bleed from another source of audio yeah. you know like I, I know there's um you might be familiar with uh isotope musical rebalance yeah i know they tried to do that and I, i've never had perfect success with it although it's been pretty close with a lot of different separating of source material, but it only, I think, gives you like four options. It only gives you like vocals, bass, drums, and then there's like an other category, whatever that means. Um, yeah. And then there's a Spleeder is another yeah. one that I found mm-hmm. out recently. Have you mm-hmm. played with Spleeder much? I haven't really had a chance. Yeah, I did. I did, actually. Uh, Spleeder is is a good example of the new trend that I was talking to you about, about deep, deep learning stuff. Mm-hmm. So Spleeder is a project by uh, by Deezer. It's the, the, French, uh, the French company Deezer. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, Deezer, they, they released this uh, toolbox, and it's a Python toolbox. So, again, it's something that, well, it's... It's usable uh, if you follow the instruction and everything, like that, but it, it requires you to code. So it's really yeah. you have to code a little bit in, in Python. It's not it's not very difficult to to try. You can you can uh, you can follow it easily. But what it does is um, separates you into a already defined set of of classes because there is a network that has been trained uh, before. And the training usually takes a lot of time. So people at Deezer, they have trained it like for a week or two weeks. Mm -hmm. And once that is trained, uh, you can apply to uh, separate these specific classes that it was trained for. And I, if I remember well, it was, you know, like drums, uh, voice, bass, and the rest or something like that. So I think the results are pretty, pretty good. Uh, They are really the state of the art. 
uh, and they are fully automatic. So that's that's a really a new thing. That something at this quality, of course, it's not it's not perfect yet, but right. that you can reach this level of quality with an automatic thing. That's pretty cool. On the other hand, it reflects also the um, one of the drawbacks uh, of deep learning is that is it's less flexible in terms of what you want to separate. It has been trained to separate this, mm -hmm. and this is what it will separate. You cannot uh, change it. You cannot manipulate. Right. Otherwise, you would have to train the network again. Yeah, for another uh, week or two. And exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 There's a, there was an interesting conversation I had with a girl on the previous podcast episode. Her name was Yan Zhu. Uh, she goes into the artist named Azuki, but she created a... Uh, she used Splitter and she created a Max device. It's called Splitter for Max. Okay. Cool. And uh, she just sent it to me. I haven't had a chance to play with it much, but uh, it's basically just Splitter running inside of Max. <laughs> so, well, that's cool. I mean, yeah, that's exactly uh, the things that uh, that uh, that inspire me to to release these these devices. I think mm -hmm. uh, making accessible these these uh, algorithms to Max users or Ableton users that that that's really a very cool stuff. I would I would look into that. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I think probably my favorite uh, Max toy that you created was Factoid. I love okay. that thing. I was playing with that this morning. It's it's real simple, real user friendly. Um, yeah. And I just you can just drag a drum loop or any audio clip into it and chop it up and get some really interesting results. Um, yes, and that was that's your newest uh, Max device that you've released, right? Yeah. You talk that's about right. that. Right. So that came uh, out like three weeks ago, I think, mm -hmm. and. After releasing Factor Zinth, which was about one and a half years already, mm -hmm. uh, I've been talking with uh, with many users. Then they they have been uh, given me great great ideas and feedback how to improve mostly the workflow because that is the thing that is most surprising as as mm -hmm. you as you told me. So there is suddenly this new way of uh, you know of displaying uh, audio as a set of components. Yeah, and then there is also the let's say unusual way of interacting with Ableton Live. You have to click on the clip and well, the workflow can be a bit simpler and a bit better. So uh, I had the idea to take the basic idea or the basic concept of uh, decomposing the sound, but make it a much more lightweight and easy to, to use device. And, um, and that's what Factoid is. So it's actually based on exactly the same uh, the composition method is also matrix factorization. It's the same code that does the the composition, mm -hmm. but the application is different. So instead of putting you uh, or creating a display uh, of a lot of uh, sound material and elements at your disposal to modify, recombine manually, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, mm -hmm. No, it, what it does is it creates the elements, but then in, it randomizes them in time. So it shifts them backwards on or or uh, mm -hmm. forwards, which is something that uh, Factor Synth cannot do, actually. Okay. And uh, it quantizes it to the bit or to the rhythm. So uh, sure. when you have a loop, what it does, it, it creates random rhythmic variations using the mm -hmm. components. Yeah. So it's a fun way of starting to to see what uh, this kind of the composition things uh, can do for you with very few manipulations. You drag uh, the clip on the device, you click on randomize and it starts generating yeah. uh, rhythmic variations. Of course, you have less control on that than with uh, Factor Synth, but I yeah. think it's a it's a fun uh, entry into this uh, uh, concept of uh, factorizing uh, sounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I would say for a lot of music producers out there, less is more. You know, sometimes when you have too much creative control, it's easy to get lost in the details and you actually stop making music because you're spending the whole time just playing with buttons rather than actually making music at some point. That's true. That's yeah. definitely true. Yeah. Definitely true. So yeah. And in, in fact, I, I mean, I love the, the options that you gave already. I mean, it has a lock components section mm -hmm. where you can basically tell it to only manipulate certain frequency ranges. Mm -hmm. um, say for like drums, you could isolate the kick drum or you yes. could only isolate like higher frequency content, like the hi-hat mm -hmm. or snares or things like that. And then, 
and you can quantize yeah. and chop those up and dry wet mix it. So it, in a sense, it reminds me of a more stripped down version of, I know it's a very different device, but like the granulator gives you mm-hmm. kind of that random results of just chopping up different frequencies. Yes. And in a sense, it's almost kind of gives me that idea of, of what's going on with the granulator, but in obviously a different context but it is cool it's it's a fun device called factoid i encourage all the listeners to go check it out um and i think it's it's only like what 19 euros so it's cheap it's it's worth yeah. buying yeah yeah it's good stuff yeah thanks thanks a lot um that is of course common things with granulator or granular synthesis devices and there are differences there are differences so the common things is that uh as you said it's the idea of loading a sample extracting elements from it, and then randomizing the output sound. Now, uh, what devices like Granulator uh, do, it's something that is called granular synthesis. There are other devices as well. And what it does is it extracts little chunks of, of waveform in this case. There are a couple of them that actually work directly on the spectrogram, so on frequencies, not only on the waveform, but most of them, uh, they extract little chunks of waveforms of a little of several milliseconds and th- these are the elements that you can uh, randomize the idea is similar to to factoid or factor synth but the difference is that instead of cutting the waveform in into chunks into uh, different temporal chunks what you get is actually a set of layers that can overlap each other so when you um, factorize a waveform uh, you get not a sequence of chunks, but a set of layers that are all of them of the same duration, actually, uh, than the original. But uh, they are kind of, you know, superposed uh, upon each other. And these are the elements that you can then shift and you can remove mm-hmm. or you can enhance. So you're working more uh, more in the um, in the spectral dimension, if you want. And things can happen at the same time, so they can overlap. So that is the main difference. Yeah, and that would be a lot of the components section of the device, right? Where you can yes. choose how much of that time is chopped and exactly factorized, as we call it. Yeah, mm-hmm. very cool. Very cool. Exactly. So, what is the future of machine learning with music? I know that's a big loaded question, but yes. you know, where where is all of this research and everything you've seen behind the scenes as far as making these tools and devices for producers? You know, where do you see machine learning, you know, say down the road 10, 20, 30 years? You know, what is Yeah, that well, that's that's a big one. Yeah. Well, um let's start with the more uh, realistic things and then maybe we can talk about more uh Sure. Uh, fantasy stuff but i think in the next years for example um talking specifically about this the composition into components right now as you have maybe noticed in in factor synth and factoid you can get cool components from some interesting stuff interesting elements but they are uh, often a bit unpredictable so you know for sure that you will get a hi-hat sometimes and you will get a, a note somewhere there yeah. Uh, but you never know exactly what you're going to get, right? Right. So there is some research uh, to be done in the sense that uh, you need to understand better um, what these algorithms are able to extract. And you need also to understand better the connection between the, um, the parameters you choose for the decomposition. Like uh, there's not many parameters, but there is the number of components and a couple of other parameters that right now is more of a trial and error. And what would be cool is to have more deeper understanding on how these parameters affect what you will get at the end. So that is one thing, a bit more uh, doing them more predictable. Another obvious thing that will undoubtedly improve in the next years will be the the quality of the of the se- of the separation itself of the resynthesis because there is one part is the extraction into components but then the other big part of the thing is that you want to regenerate it you want to resynthesize it so that they can listen to mm-hmm. the separate components right yeah and so mm, right now there's still some uh, artifacts or some leakage in the sense of source separation between the instruments, but also in the sense of components between, for example, in factoid between the hi-hat and the and the drums. Uh, so this 
I think we are going to find some some tricks to improve this kind of thing. So this is the more realistic things that I think will will going to happen. And then more in the long term, uh, I mean, you know, it's 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 such a huge field. So it's machine learning, it's artificial intelligence, which is still more general. So uh, machine learning is a small part of artificial intelligence, which is the, the broadest uh, topic, right? Right. And um, we're the, it. Terminator, the movie, you know, takes over. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's Ableton actually, grows arms and legs and comes out of your computer and right, starts exactly. playing your guitar. <laughs> that's that, exactly that's the the uh, the image that you would, that you think about and when you hear artificial intelligence. Uh, most of the time, uh, when you hear artificial intelligence, most of the time it's just machine learning. But uh, it sounds more, you know, science fiction, and sometimes a bit more uh, scary. So. So uh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's true, and of course, um, I'm not even talking about you know machines that uh, will have consciousness and these right. kind of things. Right. But right. but um, a bit more in the long term are things like they, they exist already, but they they're gonna be uh, this is gonna be an explosion, I'm sure. So the things in artificial intelligence that, for example, they generate uh, music uh, by themselves and uh, mm -hmm. they compose this is a little bit uh, different this is a bit beyond machine learning uh, machine learning it generates the elements uh, the patterns and then you can do with them whatever you want that's the yeah. factor synth or, or factor that's really pure machine learning but then a, a, a step more beyond artif uh, towards artificial artificial intelligence will be something like uh, yeah, a machine that can imitate your style, that can uh, generate the music that keeps learning with time. Um, this already exists, but I think uh, it's still a bit far from being, of course, um, undistinguishable or a very, very good quality compared with a, with a human composition. Do you know companies that are already trying to achieve that right now? So I know there are research, there is research going on um, uh, by Spotify. This mm -hmm. time it's Spotify for sure. Okay. Um, they have algorithms, right? Like, would that be part of like the Discover Weekly playlist or how they're referring new song preferences or? To be honest, I'm not sure how they plan to use it in, in their product line or if they want to um, use it uh, at all. Right now they have a, a very interesting research center here in Paris, uh, Spotify, and they do uh, this kind of, um, you know, forward thinking research in music technology to, to generate uh, progress and generate uh, IP. But I, I don't know how, how they plan to build it in, in Spotify. Maybe, maybe, um, yeah, maybe the the goal is to, to generate plays, playlists that is not really the playlist that is generated, but the music itself yeah. according to your to your okay. taste or to your style. So you play a favorite song, and then uh, you get three hours uh, of generated music uh, that resembles th this song. And each time, this music is a little bit different, and only okay. you are hearing this music for the first and the last time. This this kind of things, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's wild to think about. Sure. For the moment, I'm I'm uh, more interested in um, in approaches that really uh, doesn't take too many creative decisions away from you. So sure. uh, things that allow you to get some um, sound material to work with, some like. Uh, timbral spectral material and then you can use it as a new kind of collection of sounds or of timbres to do your your composition that's that's the thing that uh, currently uh interests me most most yeah yeah mm. well on the on the topic of like future music making um i've seen and i've heard a little bit about uh making music with brain waves <laughs> has that oh. Has that been something you've ever played with or looked at? Or, you know, no, not personally. As a matter of fact, uh, I've read about these things 
it's older than that you would think. Huh? Uh, I think like ten years ago, I saw already some <laughs> some research like trying to control uh, synthesis uh, yeah. with brain waves and uh, you know with these uh, yeah. sensors, these uh, EEG sensors on the head, and then you will reinterpret the signals and then you will convert it into MIDI parameters and you can think music, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't worked with uh, these kind of things actually, and. Uh, uh, well, I, I'm not sure if if any companies are pushing that uh, a lot, or if it's gonna be a, an Ableton device uh, working in these directions. Yeah. Uh, but I would be very interested to to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, same. There's a. Uh, I've seen a couple of different products that are like in beta. One's called like Mind MIDI, mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple other out there. But I I honestly don't know how they how well they work. Um, I met a guy at Loop last year in LA and he was talking to me about one of his friends was involved in prototyping some of those things. And he was, and apparently it wasn't quite there yet, but he's mm -hmm. like, it's close. It's on its way. There will be a day where you could stand on a stage and just think music. <laughs> like that's just a yeah. weird thought to me. It's just going to a concert and just watching some guy just Am standing thinking? there, just bouncing his head, you know, on stage <laughs> by himself. Well, I think that they will will arrive. Uh, I don't yeah. know when, but <laughs> that will completely change the the life scene of electronic music. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's a, it's already strange. I think uh, today to see a, a, a lonely guy on stage with a laptop sitting there mm -hmm. that already happens a lot. Yeah. So it will still even be weirder, like watching a guy just standing there. That's right with a big helmet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just yeah, it's funny. It's weird. It, it comes down to that point of it's like you know. How, what's that balance of having technology make music for you and then also you being able to use technology to be more creative? You know, I've, there, I've heard a lot of arguments from people where it's like, are you a true musician if you don't play an instrument? And I, I would say that, like, if you can use any creative tool, technology, whether you play a guitar or not, like music is music. I think it's really cool, like to have more creative, more creativity and technology. But, you know, it's it's like that that line of like some people would would argue maybe that like having a helmet for thinking music isn't actually playing music i don't really know but it's fascinating that this technology is coming out and i think it allows us to be more creative i agree i agree with you there is this uh fear that you know technology will replace music but uh, you know what this is this is also an old thing i mean they're having people mm, not exactly using uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, but you know the concept of random uh, randomness in music. This uh, this is almost one hundred years old, even even older, and uh, people were saying the same. I mean, if you just uh, are uh, throwing the dice and doing letting other factors create your music then what are what are you doing why are you a musician this is quite older actually that that it seems and i think it's the same debate that uh, arises now with artificial uh, artificial intelligence what i think is that it's it's also an interesting type of music and uh, it maybe changes the definition of what a musical performance is but but it it uh, doesn't cancel the the curiosity or, or the validity of the of the music that is created that way right. and also um i would say that of course it's not just a matter of throwing the dice or pushing buttons or standing uh, on stage with a helmet i mean there is a lot of work behind uh not only by the guy who created the tool but i'm yeah. sure that the, the musician the musicians have um also spent the time defining what they want to expect, defining the, the parameters, defining the possible outcomes. Yeah. So I think it doesn't kill necessarily the, the creative process. Totally. Yeah, I agree 100%. Because in the end of the day, you still have to make choices, what you're going to use, what you're going to randomize, and what you're not. I think in the end of the day, you still have to make a choice, and people are going to hear the choices you create. So yeah, that's cool. What, what future projects do you have coming up? Um, what's, what's next for you? Right, so um, right now I'm working on uh, version two of FactorSync. That's the next uh, big thing. So um, I'm gathering. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited because I think it's gonna be uh, 
as um, flexible as the first one, but uh, easier to use, I think, because uh, I gathered all the feedback that I'm getting. Cool. Um, and I'm changing the, the workflow, I think, for the better. So I'm simplifying it. Um, so there is this weird thing uh, of factoring where you have to select the clip and, and import it. That's a bit strange. So I'm getting rid of it and I'm doing it uh, a little bit. Yeah, like um, like a granulator device or like, uh, the, you know, if you know um, Ableton's looper device, it's a device where there is a, there is a transport system, like a playback system on the device itself. So mm -hmm. you don't have to uh, worry about where the clip is originally on the live set. So you just you just drag and drop your clip, and then you play it uh, wherever you whenever you want, and uh, it's gonna synchronize with um, uh, with the tempo if you want uh, in in in, uh, in session view. Yeah, Actually, this this is something that the uh, factoid already uh, has. So the transport system, right. this is playback button, and the synchronization is built on the device. So. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put it into FactorSynth, and nice. I already have some prototypes, and it's it's much uh, easier to to use, I think, yeah. uh, still having the the same um, uh, flexibility uh, with the components. And there's also going to be a couple of features, a new features. So, for example, uh, you will be able to um, change the panning of the components, right? So, you could say uh, you can start from a mono uh, clip. And then you can say, okay, put me the hi hat to the left and the kick drum to the right, or you can randomize it, right? So you can up mix, uh, you can generate stereo uh, um, mixes from mono files, That's or great. or change uh, the stereo distribution of of stereo files, and and I th I think that's a, that's a cool thing, yeah. Oh, totally. That's a great value add. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, cool. I'm, I'm working on that, and let's hope. Uh, well, I don't know. I'm. I prefer not to say a date right now, but I'm working on that. That's going to be uh, in the coming months. That's going to be the next uh, right. release. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'll have to play with that some more when it comes out. And I sure. know you are. You going to release the newest update through Isotonic Studios? Yes, it's going to okay. be Isotonic. Yeah, cool. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. and he has a great website. He's got lots of stuff. Darren Cowley is the founder of Isotonic. He was on the podcast a while ago. All um, right, cool. Yeah, so I know him. He's a good guy. He's doing. They, cool they do. A, they do a great job. He does a great job. I mean, uh, we're a collection mostly of independent researchers, uh, Max for Life, and I think uh, it's really in Max for Life where these kind of crazy experiments happen because you know the Max language is flexible and it appeals to this uh, kind of electronic musicians that that uh, that want to explore this. These, these new these new methods and the isotonic it gathers all this uh, bunch of of um, uh, of independent developers and there are uh, under the same um, you know the same group the same web page and I think they they do really a great great job yeah yeah they really do for sure well and you did a great job too I mean factor synth and my personal favorite factoid I think those are cool devices. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So I'm interested to see more of the stuff that you release. There's also a Factor Synth Mini as well. Um, yes. Sure, I wanted to mention. It's just yeah. a little a baby version of Factor Synth. Exactly, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's cute. Cool. Well, thanks, man, for your time and everything that you've shared today. I want to be respectful of your time. So I'll just be looking forward to that new Factor Synth. I'll include links in the show notes. So everybody listening, go check out the show notes in this episode, and I'll include links to uh, JJ's website and everything else. Thank you, man, for joining the podcast. Yeah. And, yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Thanks yeah, a lot, Dan. Maybe we'll have you back on the podcast another day. Sure. Cool. Have sure. a good evening, man. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye. Bye. This podcast is sponsored by LiveProducersOnline.com, a community of Ableton Live users connecting you to the pros to learn today's music production.